Hello and a very warm welcome to the Crash MotoGP podcast, episode 25. And we are back into preview mode because we are back in Italy for the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix at the Misano World Circuit. Marco Simoncelli this weekend. Uh, myself, Harry Benjamin, Keith Hewin, and Pete mclaren with all the very latest moto gp news thoughts and opinions coming your way plus new champions crowned over the weekend in the world Superport sp- uh, series and british superbikes plus uh, with world superbikes approaching its finale we'll have a word on that too but mr keith you and you were once again a busy man this weekend back in the bsb uh, paddock for the uh, the showdown of showdowns the finale and we do have uh, a bsb champion in taron mckenzie how was it it was brilliant. I mean, it's one of those situations where BSB, British Superbikes, is so easy to get around. I mean, when you've been, you know, seven years recent on MotoGP where the paddock is tight, it's restricted, there's regulations, you know, step over this bloody white line boundary and somebody's on top of you straight away <laughs> looking at your pass. And yet you've got the relaxed BSB paddock. I mean, it's almost embarrassing sometimes. I mean, I was still in pit lane, uh, you know, during the Ducati tri-options um, session, um, bearing in mind that the VSP paddock obviously have all the garages and then everyone else that's going to perform in the next session has to load all their kit and their trolleys and their tyre warmers and their generators in front of those garages. And it's quite narrow, the paddock, uh, the pit lane in, in uh, brands anyway. There's not, not a lot of room at brands to, to do anything more with it. Um, so you've got all these guys that are working away and trying to get on with their session. And all of a sudden you've got like, 50 people wandering through like it's like a, a Chinese tour, you know, a person with a flag and all these 50 odd people that are wandering behind them. And they're on the, the Bennett's exclusive VIP tour Ooh. that moves through. Yeah. And I, I just from a, from a MotoGP perspective, you know, like they'd be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> they'd never be allowed to be near the place. So it is a really, really accessible, friendly panel. And by normal tickets, you can be at the back of the garages anyway. So, you know, you can catch the... And it's got a lovely atmosphere to it. I mean, Brands is brilliant anyway. It's one of my very favourite places to be in the world. So I'm probably a bit biased anyhow. And it's just got a great atmosphere for British Superbikes. I mean, there's not a lot of money. You can tell that there's not a lot of money in the teams and so on. It hasn't really filtered so much to some of the teams. Um, but, you know, but as, a, as, a, as an event, as a as a showdown it's just fantastic and the racing is always good um it's difficult isn't it we, we're so spoiled we've got world superbikes that's probably at the top of its game at the moment well worth watching motor gp that's well worth watching thanks to god they've had holiday otherwise you wouldn't have, you'd never move away from the telly um and bsb is is well worth watching across all the classes if you can manage to work out where on earth they are in the telly schedule i don't know whether anybody's tried doing that but it is like a bloody nightmare and as the schedules get moved because of rain or weather or whatever it is, just record everything, whatever it is. So if you miss something, you'll be able to get back to it. Um, but from a personal point of view, I mean, uh, poor old Jack Bernicall, you know, he, he, he he's, I spoke to him on Wednesday. I got the call again on Wednesday for this weekend for the finale. I thought he would be fit for the finale. So I, <laughs> I had quite a busy week, so I didn't do any prep. And then, of course, Sod's Law yeah. says that Wednesday you get the call um, and all of a sudden you're scratching around in paperwork trying to, because it's that old thing, and, and uh, uh, Pete, maybe not so much you, but Ari, I know for sure, you've never done enough prep. <laughs> it's like you're trying to cram for an exam the day before the exam, and we all know that never works. Yep. And and it kind of like, and that panic that sort of sinks through. And the fact was, is the first one I'll get away with, you know, I got parachuted in a couple of days beforehand to cover for Jack, um, which is fine. You can get away with a load of oohs and ahs and whatever else you want to stick in there. The second one you've got to do a bit more work for because they're going to find you out if you don't do a bit of work. But the third one, you've got to be bang on it. Otherwise, you're going to get trolled like <laughs> mad on Twitter or some other horrible platform. And, uh, and of course, I, I had a bit... And it's the finale, which means it's the end of all the championships and all the other stuff. And you've got, you've got to get your maths right. And podiums for that and, 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 and a trophy that I never even knew about. There's the best of the rest, <laughs> isn't there, for... for Lee Bob Jackson, of course, finished ninth overall because he couldn't be in the top eight, which were the showdown runners. Um, but there is a there is a place of winning a trophy if you finish ninth or uh, ahead of all the rest, the best of the rest, effectively. I didn't even look that one up. Poor old Lee Bob Jackson. You know, it's one of them ones where I do apologise. I mean, it, it sounds I didn't even know there was one until the weekend. Um, but and then, of course, comes the the traditional um sunday night piss up in the paddock which uh, 
it, it, it always sounds better than it actually turns out to be. And I mean, the music is great and every, you're moving from tent to tent to, to party to party. There's always parties going on. But by the time it gets to about midnight and it's freezing bloody cold and you've had a really long weekend, and, and, and dare I say it, there's only blokes left in the paddock by this time. Um, so, so from that point of view, it's, it's a slightly one-sided um, beer-throwing contest by the time you get to the end of the, in the evening. So you've got to pick your moment to duck out of it. If my voice sounds a little yeah. jaded, it's because it is. I was just about to say, if you are wondering why Keith sounds maybe a little bit lower than usual, uh, <laughs> there's your answer. Air conditioning. I, I always blame hotel air conditioning when I've uh, been there. Uh, yeah. When I've had a good chat. <laughs> well, it was uh, a great weekend of racing, really, not just in the British Superbikes, uh, but Pete also World Supersport crowned uh, a champion as well. Dominique Agata, he's clinched the 2021 World Supersport uh, Super Sport title with his 14th podium of the year. So uh, a good, uh, well, a gr- not just a good run, a great run for Agata. It is, yes. And also for Tenkate, the team as well, you know, they, they dominated that class for many years with Honda machinery. And then they sort of, they, they were up in Superbike for a bit, then sort of they had the rug pulled out from under them when Honda switched sort of allegiance to their own, another team and factory effort. Now they've come back with Agata. Um, you know, Agata was fighting, of course, also for the Moto E title this year, wasn't he? And that came down to a, a bit of a uh, <laughs> a last like dog fight, shall we say? <laughs> yes. So he lost out on that one, um, but also he had to skip. I think it was at least uh, one World Super Sport round, wasn't it? Because of a clash with Moto E. So you know, he's had such an advantage that he's been able to win this title one round early, even though he's been doing Moto E as well. So yeah, great news for him. You know, he it's the first time he's won a major championship. I think he's he's always been he's in Moto Two for many years, um, and yeah, he's finally got got the job done. Shall we say? So congratulations to him. I tell you what, great stat this morning I read. Gavin Emmett, that git who took my job at BT. Only joking, only joking. <laughs> Gavin Emmett put out this morning that 2017 Kiefer Racing Moto2 team wasn't bad after all because Tara McKenzie, Domi Agata were both the Moto2 teamsters on Kiefer Racing. Sadly, the year he died, 2017. I mean, Kiefer was a major, major loss. I mean, it was one that, you, you know, Died in his sleep overnight. Perfectly fit man. I mean, just one of the shocks of the bloody, well, <laughs> shock of life, I think, with that one. But Kiefer Racing employed both those guys. And here they are, one winning the best domestic championship in the world and the other one winning the mm. Super Sports Championship. So I think a legacy to Kiefer Racing um, from my perspective. And thank you very much, Gavin Emmett, for the stat. Yeah, I, mean, I saw that as well. Quality brilliant. stat. I hate stats generally. That's <laughs> that really was a brilliant stat and uh, clearly had a, a good eye for talent as well. Um, it was the penultimate round, obviously, as well in Argentina at the weekend in the World Super uh, Superbikes with uh, Top Rack uh, on for two wins and Scott Redding uh, taking one. And the final uh, is uh, getting going at the new Mandalika circuit in Indonesia. Top rack with a 30 point lead over Jonathan Ray, then Reading in third, still in with a chance. It's all setting up rather nicely in World Superbikes, Keith, isn't it? He who makes a mistake will pay most. <laughs> I mean, I think, we're, again, if we if we use the analogy of, um, of the British Superbikes, I know there's more races, I think, with the British Superbikes in the showdown, but um, O'Halloran came into the showdown with a 30 point lead over everyone else, and he ended up finishing third. Obviously, Taz McKenzie, I mean, it's a, it's a romantic thing, isn't it? I mean, I love seeing all the photographs and stuff like that. It was there was one out this morning from um, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was a photograph I saw uh, that that you could see Taz McKenzie on his dad's bike twenty five years ago because his dad won the first of the uh, late era superbike championships in this country in the UK. Um, and there's a picture of Taz on the bike twenty five years ago when his dad did that, and twenty five years on. Taron wins it. You know, there's a slightly romantic angle to it. Um, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> there, I'll tell you what. When you have a night like you have, like I've had. Yeah. <laughs> It was a good night. <laughs> it's good night. I think where were, where were we going with that? I think in the World Superbike final, it's going to be, yeah, least the person with the least mistakes. Yeah. Got you. Least mistakes. Harry, thank, thank Evan for a young brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> or should I say one that isn't tar- topped up with Jack Yeah, Daniel. not yet. Um, yeah, not yet. Yeah, you're, I mean, it's going to be the one who makes the least mistakes. I mean, I love the fact that Scott Redding uh, won a race. I love Scott Redding on the on the podium as well in the Park Ferme when when he was he was doing that. They had that bottle cam, didn't they? The champagne camera where Brilliant, he kind of speaks it? to the bottle. <laughs> and uh, I know that feeling right now. Um, 
And, uh, and he was quoting that, that, you know, Top Rack was as aggressive as ever, but I got the better of him this time. You know, it, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's good, isn't it? You've got BSB that's a really friendly environment. You've got the competitiveness of World Superbike, kind of a halfway house between the, the, the MotoGP guys that seem to be very sadly heading towards um, MotoGP in their, in their uh, employment of, of, you know, guardians of the white line. Um, in pit lane or wherever it might be. And, and one of my fears, again, you know what I'm like off at a tangent, it's probably because I can't remember where I was supposed to be going in this conversation, but anyway, um, is that I think that Dorna will use the pandemic as a bloody excuse for making it like Formula One in the back of the pits. Uh, and that will be detrimental to the sport and the fans, in my view. And I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I'm just laying down a marker on this one so we can discuss it next year when we all get back to paddocks and the like. Yeah. I think it's one of them ones where one of the biggest things about British Superbike particularly is fans' access, World Superbike to an extent, fans' access and the uh, the way that riders are prepared to spend time to talk to, to fans and, and be more available. And I think MotoGP falls down on this particular front, in my view. What do they gain from doing something like that? Because is there, you know, does that mean they can then obviously monetize it in certain ways and make more money? Or is it just a, a bit of a, you know, elitism or so, almost? I think what you've got, I, I, there is an elitism type thing, I think, as well. But I think what you've got is, it is, and this is the difference, MotoGP is intense, absolutely incredibly pressurized. Um, I think the whole thing, you, 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 you're the nth degree, you're the, the pinnacle of our motorcycle sport. And what they have to do to achieve what they achieve is is a, at a much higher intensity. I mean, there will be people who disagree with that. Um, you know, BSB, did Taron McKenzie put in any less effort or any less stress into winning that title than, than say, Marquez in the past or what? Probably not is the truth of it. I'm sure Taron McKenzie. But when, when I went to, to the Macam's garage on Sunday, okay, he was already declared. No, he hadn't been actually. This was before he was actually declared champion. So there we are in the garage, and there must have been a 100 bloody people in there. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine that ever happening anywhere else. I mean, uh, these are guests of Macams, guests of guests, guests of mine, me. You know, like I wouldn't be allowed to, to walk into a, a MotoGP garage. Well, you probably could, but you, you'd be frowned on. You wouldn't be made welcome, welcome. And all of that, take... It can have two effects, can't it? It can relax you because you're in this family friendly, everybody's. If you're the type of rider that, that I was and could relax with that situation, I liked a lot of people around. I like a buzz. I like to, you know, have a bit of a chin wag on the grid or whatever it might mm. be. But there are a lot of people that react in the opposite way to that, that can't focus, that can't get their brain to be in that zone that they need it to be in. So you can argue it both ways. But it does. It did seem alien to me to be in a BSB paddock where there were so many bloody people that were in the garages and on the pit lane. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm moving again, as I do, off at a different tangent. I couldn't believe how slippery the little bit of concrete apron in front of the garages were where these riders come in. OK, they're on they're on a, on a pit lane limiter da, 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 all the way down the pit lane. But then you turn off the tarmac onto this really slippery concrete and I had visions of somebody coming in there in a little bit more of a spirited manner, leaving it a little bit later on the brakes and uh, wiping out and taking oh. a dozen bloody punters that shouldn't have been there in the first place down with them. Um, and it could happen in future. I mean, I, I, you know, anybody that listens to this, I mean, if I don't know whether Stuart Higgs ever listens to this podcast. I suspect he probably does because Stuart's across just about everything. He'll be going, hmm, he'll be thinking about it because it, it was bloody slippery. We had a little bit of rain and it made it really greasy in front wow. of those garages. And you could feel the difference between the tarmac and the concrete. Um, and again, being a car man, fixed axle on an Indy car, I always remember an Indy car leaving the pit garages somewhere or the other. And as it left with that big wheel spin and bloody methanol sprayed and everybody everywhere type thing, as it got half on the tarmac and half on the concrete it just turned straight yeah. round, just swapped ends um so that transition is is quite a 
quite a tricky one. And if you've got, as you say... Especially when you've got a load of human human barriers well, in your way. Yeah, if you've got a million bloody people in your box, then then that question does become, OK, well, let's allow some people, but let's have a cap and let's do it in a, an appropriate way. Um, we spoke a little bit there about, um, obviously, World Superbikes and MotoGP and Jonathan Ray in particular. I thought... A nice little crossover, a nice little segue, because Rossi in the last week, the great Valentino Rossi, Mr. Pete McLaren, has said uh, it was a great shame, really, that Jonathan Ray never really got a proper MotoGP chance. I think Ray was actually quite buoyed at at the fact that Rossi was saying that about him. I mean, just look at the statistics. I mean, a six-time world champion in superbikes, and and exactly, you you would think that would automatically enable you to get, you know, a prime ride in MotoGP, but it just never quite happened for Jonathan. Of course, he did ride the Repsol Honda as a substitute rider, um, but he, he never got the quite quite rightly, I think. When you're that successful, you want to have a top ride, you know, with a factory team. And why should you leave? We're now having this question, aren't we, about top rack as well? Why should they leave a championship where they're at the front to take a bike that maybe is not, you know, if they're not sure of their equipment, let's say, it's going to be a big enough challenge as it is, switching to MotoGP, prototype championship, different tyres, et cetera, et cetera. They want to be sure they're in the best possible situation. And uh, yet, you know, Jonathan clearly didn't feel he had. There was certainly interest from teams. I remember you know, Suzuki, there was also talk about maybe they were, but it never quite happened for whatever reason. And uh, yeah, undoubtedly, you can see why Rossi would say that, you know, look at, look at Ray's success. Um, you would think that it would be great to see what he could do in MotoGP. But sadly, it looks like, you know, he's at, he's at the, the wrong end of his career now, isn't he, to make that change? Well, Keith, Ross- Rossi's just getting on the bandwagon. Yeah. <laughs> Rossi, he's just jumped on the bandwagon. It's what, it's what we've all been saying yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is, Ten Carter held Jonathan back. Don- Jonathan was doing, on the Ten Carter Honda, going back World Superbike again, he was doing stuff on that Honda that everybody in the paddock recognises remarkable, the way he was riding that. And that was the time... I don't the problem is with Honda is you'll never find out what the real deal was behind the scenes. My understanding was that Honda kept on dangling that carrot for for Jonathan and keeping it keeping him in the Tenkata Honda World Superbike team, you know, with the with the the kind of there might be a deal, there might be a deal, there will be a deal kind of thing down the road. Yeah, you know, when we consider when he did ride that Repsol bike, was told not to crash it and finished where he did. I think he showed his talent the couple of times he had a go on a, on a MotoGP bike. I don't understand why it, there is, there's no personality trait that you wouldn't want in your camp. Jonathan Ray is a professional, consummate. You, you know, his personality might not be to everybody's taste, but then Razgadi Oglu's personality might not be to everybody's taste. Scott Redding's personality, they, they are... That's the wonderful thing about World Superbike. The individuals that we've got at the moment that are up the front are all so different. You can pick a man that you like the like the, the cut of his jib to go back a, a, a decade or 20. You know, which one do you favour? I mean, Scott Redding, <laughs> brilliant. Jack the Lad tattoos all up his neck, you know, tells it how it is. Razgati Oglu from a massive, great, bloody Muslim country and, and, a, and a following from the president of the country who's, who's controversial in himself. There's another one you can follow up if you fancy a bit of politics in your bike racing. And, and of course, Jonathan Ray, who comes from a, a region of the UK that is always under some kind of dispute or another, um, with a, a, a family man with a great wife, great kids, everything stable. I mean, like some would say boring. Um, but the fact is that will appeal to a lot of people as well. So I think World Superbike have got they've got great personalities in there at the moment. It surprised me sometimes why it's uh, it's found itself at the bottom of the pile when it comes to popularity. Well, uh, it's it's one of those great uh, things about racing, isn't it? You you get behind the the riders and the, the stories and the personalities just as much as you get behind you know the actual sport and what happens on track. But with with, with Jonathan Ray, think, and Rossi said this as well. You know, he thinks Ray could still be fast if he was given. Uh, a MotoGP opportunity. Do you think it's it's probably too late now? <laughs> 